So I'm going to present on the uh, mundane topic of perforated appendicitis. Um, and I'm going to uh, go through a few articles, some from our place and uh, some from um, other institutions. And so here's the first question. Um, and I realize that uh, in reading this question, we don't do a lot of CT scans, but I just sort of thought the information was, was kind of interesting, so I developed a slide around the, uh, the information in, in the paper. And so you see a 12-year-old child with signs and symptoms of appendicitis. Uh, he's been symptomatic for 36 hours. You think his appendix may have perforated and, and decide to order a CT scan. So the question is, how accurate is the CT scan in diagnosing perforated appendicitis? There was this uh, paper that came from uh, uh, our place. Uh, I was not uh, part of it, uh, but uh, my colleagues were, and I just thought it was interesting information. Uh, and it was in the Journal of Pediatric Surgery in 2010. And so what the paper's about is there were 200 CT scans who were reviewed uh, by um, six surgeons, two of whom were fellows, and two radiologists, so eight people. Uh, the reviewers were blinded as to the diagnosis. Uh, there was a lot of experience among those viewing the uh, scans, and you could argue that the, the fellows probably had the most experience because they're looking at those every day. Uh, and the reviewers were then asked to diagnose perforated or non-perforated appendicitis. And on these scans, there were no abscesses. And so what was found was that the reviewers were correct in 72% of the CT scans, which I thought was, was a pretty interesting figure. <laughs> uh, the sensitivity and specificity are, as you see, and the positive predictive value and negative predictive value are also seen. But anyway, I just thought that was kind of interesting because on first glance, Gee, I would have thought it was 90%, uh, but it's really a little better than two out of three or two-thirds. So You said there were no abscesses, or did you eliminate cases that yeah. had abscesses? Yeah, there were no abscesses. Yeah, cases were excluded. were excluded if they had an abscess. Thank you. So anyway, I just thought that was kind of a, an interesting, um, interesting information. All right. So um, you operate on this child and think he has perforated appendicitis. In the operating room, how accurate is your visualization of the appendix in determining if it has perforated or not? Okay, so I think this is important because this, this sort of gets, is gonna get to the idea of, of papers in the literature on perforated uh, appendicitis versus non-perforated versus suppurative uh, versus gangrenous. Uh, because most of the papers, um, they just mentioned that the patient has perforated appendicitis. And I, I always w wonder that, that, the di that the, uh, there's no real definition of perforated appendicitis. And a lot of us have differing uh, ideas of what a perforated appendix looks like. So in this paper, this is from uh, Dr. Ponsky, was the uh, lead uh, author, inter-observer uh, inter variation in the ass assessment of appendiceal perforation. Uh, and this was in 2009. And so what uh, Dr. Ponsky and his group did was uh, there were 110 surgeons uh, involved, 62 attendings and 48 fellows. These were adult surgeons as well as pediatric surgeons. Um, there was a cross-section of surgeons. They were uh, uni from university hospitals, community hospitals, and children's hospitals. And among the attendings, the agreement in defining an image uh, as to whether the appendix was perforated or not was 27%. So uh, if you notice the, um, the uh, answers, I think they were either... 90 or 70 percent and and in point of fact there's a wide variation in what each of us thinks is perforated appendicitis so i thought I've, I've always thought this was a great uh, you know one of the great funny, paper so we we took one image we showed people images and some 
and there was the agreement among surgeons was no different than chance alone on whether or not was this perforated or not. They were not agreeing. But the funniest is we took one of the images, turned it upside down and flipped it to the left, and even people didn't agree with themselves when they saw the same <laughs> picture later on in the study. So inter and intra-observer variability was close to chance alone. Yeah, and I think that's, this is a, uh, I personally think this is a real problem when, uh, when we talk about perforated appendicitis because we can't come up with uh, a definition. So um, at our hospital, uh, we identify perforated appendicitis as a hole in the appendix or a fecalith in the abdomen, and, and that's it. Uh, if we don't see the hole or we don't see the fecalith, uh, then it's not perforated. And Dr. Um, St. Peter came up with this um, definition for one of our prospective uh, trials uh, in the early 2000s, and, I, and we still use it today. Uh, and I think, it's, I think it's a nice definition that I, I would like or I would hope that uh, we all might be able to use when we're talking about perforated appendicitis so we all think we're talking about the same disease process. I think that because of your paper, I do think that at least of the places I've seen have adopted what you, what you all have shown. Um, but what's controversy is, is, is everything else in the acute appendicitis group or is there a middle no, bucket? It's one or the other. Right. Uh, and there are a lot of people who would put gangrenous into something else. So what, what we're going to get into that. All right. The way Sean explained it to me is in the, it, when they grouped stool in the abdomen or a hole in the appendix, when they took all of those patients that didn't have either of those, the incidence of abscess was less than 5%. That's the way Sean explained right. to me on why, why that grouping happened. Is that, and, and that's why we, why we, care. That, that's what we care, why we yeah, care about right. is who develops a post-operative abscess. Yeah. So the data from this uh, paper, uh, are right is right here. So in that paper I just showed, for the two years before a definition was used, we did 292 uh, non-perforated appendicitis and had an abscess development of 1.7%. And we did 131 perforated appendicitis and we had an abscess development of 14%. And then we apply the definition for two years, uh, and the abscess rate actually dropped for the non-perforated appendicitis, uh, and it rose for the perforated appendicitis. And so what that tells you is that in the two years before, uh, we were uh, treating some of the non-perforated that were probably perforated, uh, and the perf some of the non-perforated were perforated uh, in, the, uh, in the two years before, and then you got those out of the denominator, and so the abscess rate went from 14 to 18 percent after the definition. So anyway, I think uh, this is the only paper that I know of talking about definition of uh, perforated appendicitis, and I would just uh, I just think it's a really uh, simple and easy definition to use, and it's uh, at least been validated in this one paper. All right. Uh, uh, and as Todd said, uh, it really identifies those patients at risk or not at risk for developing a post-operative uh, abscess. All right, the next uh, uh, question is, you find the patient has perforated appendicitis and your resident asks you if irrigation of the abdominal cavity is beneficial. Well, I think there's uh, probably a lot of uh, controversy uh, out there on this uh, on this topic, and I'll just show you uh, uh, from our uh, hospital uh, that uh, Dr. St. Peter was the principal investigator on this particular study, um, uh, comparing patients undergoing irrigation uh, and suction versus suction alone uh, during a laparoscopic appendectomy for perforated appendicitis. And uh, we use that standardized definition of perforation uh, in this trial, there were 110 patients in each arm. Uh, the surgeon, in the arm in which irrigation was used, the surgeon had to use 500 cc's of irrigation as a, a minimum. The average uh, was about 850 cc's that was used. Uh, there were no differences in the patient characteristics at presentation, 
And the results found that there was no difference in the abscess rate between the two groups, the length of hospitalization, hospital charges, or operative time. Uh, and so our conclusion was there was no advantage to using irrigation at the time of laparoscopic appendectomy for perforated appendicitis. Now, what that doesn't say is that there's no necessarily disadvantage to using it. So if you still believe that you want to irrigate, uh, it's probably fine to do that. There's just no advantage to, uh, to irrigating. Can I stop you yes. for a second? Some of the criticism to that report has been that the both of the incidences of abscess formation are higher than some other studies, the 18 and the 19 percent. So any, any thought about that? I'm sure you've heard that before. Yeah, so I would say that's because of the definition that we used. Okay. It was a standardized definition, so all six or seven surgeons were using the same criteria for perforation. And we were we were not putting non-perforated appendicitis patients in the cohort who were listed as perforated. So therefore, the abscess rate is truly reflective of perforated appendicitis. Makes sense. And that's why, that's why I brought up the idea of the definition. Was there a debate about how much irrigation? Because there are surgeons who do leaders and leaders and leaders and leaders. Right. You say that makes a difference. Right. So I've got a, a recent paper okay. on that. Great. Um, so here's a, um, a paper from um, our uh, colleagues in um, Minneapolis at the University of uh, Minnesota that just came out this year on standardized irrigation technique reduces abscess formation after appendectomy. So in, in, in reading this study, um, I would say there are a couple of problems that I've identified. It's a retrospective study, but there was no definition of perforation mentioned in the paper, and there was no standard antibiotic usage over the study period, which was 10 years from 2007 to um, 2017, uh, 432 patients. Now, of those 432 patients, 105 of them were perforated, which is about 10 patients per year with perforated appendicitis. Um, and so the study was about a standardized large volume irrigation by one of the surgeons, uh, somewhere between three and 12 liters uh, in small focus directed aliquots, uh, comparing that to surgeon preference for the other surgeons for the irrigation. Uh, and the results were that uh, patients with perforated appendicitis, if you used this uh, standardized large volume irrigation, the rate of abscess development was zero uh, versus uh, about 19% if, um, if it was surgeon discretion or surgeon preference used. Uh, so although it's an interesting study, I, I would say that there are a couple of problems uh, with the study design so I think you, are, you need to take the information with a little grain of salt. Zero versus 18. True. It changed my practice, this study. And I maybe, what, did you have comments about it or no? Yeah, more just um, for uh, in general, I think one of the issues is that no matter how good your data are, you can't beat a good rhyme. Um, so the solution to pollution is dilution. <laughs> you have to come up with something different. So I, my idea was um, potentially... Uh, the inoculation for contamination is aspiration. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's put that out there. I like that. So I, I, Be sure know, to I, interview at our place. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there you go. So I, um, I don't do nearly as much as he did. You know, the way this study happened is apparently that they were all teasing him that he used so, so much irrigation, so they studied it to show him how crazy it was. You know, oops, <laughs> their study showed his abscess rate was much less. I can less. do the same study at my place. What's that? I oh, could do the same study. Yeah, really? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so anyway, I think, I think there's a lot of a focus on this uh, particular paper and uh, just wanted to try to present the, the details of it. Um, for what it's worth, there is a meta-analysis uh, that came out last year uh, looking at irrigation versus suction alone for um, laparoscopic uh, uh, appendectomy. 
the uh, there are a few problems with this meta analysis, and I hope everyone realizes that just because it's a meta a meta analysis doesn't mean it's necessarily a higher level of study because the the meta analysis is only as good as the component uh, studies uh, which are being analyzed. But there were three randomized trials and two retrospective observational studies, uh, 2,500 uh, patients. Most of them were adults, though. Four-fifths of them were adults. Uh, and the authors did not find any difference regarding development of an abscess, wound infection, or length of hospitalization. So the authors came to the conclusion that there was no advantage to irrigation when compared uh, to suction alone. It's a good topic that we could do every year. <laughs> right. We can keep doing this. There's, so uh, any comments or questions from anyone who does something different than what Dr. Holcomb recommended? Uh, I mean, there's a lot here. Do we, so do we irrigate or not? <laughs> uh, the answer is we don't have an answer. The, the best quality study said no difference. The more recent study that was uh, uh, not as a well-designed study did show a difference. I think we can go by and see. Uh, so, Alex, in your practice, when you're, an when you're a pediatric surgeon, what are you going to do, irrigate or not? I don't know. Don't know. <laughs> you don't deal with it. I don't deal with it. Okay. Liz? No irrigation, but but do suction out visible pus. So so Alex's aspiration <laughs> rhyme. Right, same. Aspiration. Yeah, localized aspiration. Localized aspiration. That's different. I'm talking about localized pus too, not ah. not mm -hmm. four quadrant. So let me make one point yes. about that study that disagreed with with yours is that this person did a tiny amount of irrigation, push suck, push suck, mm -hmm. push suck. So he never irrigated the whole belly. It was a focused push suck, push suck, push suck. So. 100 cc's at a time. Mm -hmm. So I have modified since that study. I never irrigated after yours for years. And then when this came out, now I'm, now I'm irrigating. So uh, I don't know, do you irrigate? No, no for Von Allman, <laughs> Fred? Selectively. Selectively, Deb? So the, the comment from Dr. Bill Meyer is that it, 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 there's different situations. If the appendix has been sort of walled off and protected by the omentum, uh, that's a different situation when there's pus everywhere. Um, one interesting thing about pus everywhere is that in, in their study, um, that was one of the findings that was in the group of no, of very low abscess. The pus everywhere didn't seem to correlate. You know, when we see the exudate, but not actually a hole or not actually stool, that exudate did not seem to pose a risk for abscess, which was probably one of the biggest changes for me. Do you irrigate or not? No. Mira, no. So it's a mix here. Sorry, we can't give you a definite answer. There's a comment here about a study from Montreal that grades the degree of contamination and correlates that to the abscess rate. So it's not all perforated. Perforations are created equally. Ah, uh, interesting. From Dr. Okay. Baird. But I think I Who think that? The, Baird. Rob Baird. Robert Baird. Okay. I, I do think it's it really would behoove all of us if we came up with some standardized definitions. So we're all talking about the the same disease process. Yeah. Well, we'll get there eventually in the next 30 years. Okay.